Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Uh, look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Sean Porter delivered for us this last weekend against Devin Alexander. As I said in the pre-fight video, it's not about talent as much as it's about the styles of the fighters, right? If the talent's close, it's the fighter who has the style to exploit the other fighter's weaknesses who will win the fight. Now let's talk about what a blueprint is. You've heard me mention in video after video the idea of a fighter having a blueprint on how to beat his opponent. What a blueprint is, is in my opinion, it's a map with markers that is specifically tailored for the opponent, right? It is a strategy. Now let me just make a point here. Not every fighter can use a blueprint. A fighter has to be, in my opinion, adaptive, reactive. He can't be a rote guy fighting the same fight every fight. Rather, he has to be a guy who knows the sport well enough so he could literally adapt and change things for his upcoming opponent. Right? When a blueprint is followed properly, it's a fight where the weaknesses of the opponent are laid bare for the public, right? The opponent is so exposed that people understand that that's the weak link in the opponent's chain, right? A chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And so when a previously smiled upon opponent has a weakness in their game, and the opponent has the blueprint, knows how to target that weakness, knows how to find that weakness, and actually has the skills to exploit that weakness, then that's a gambling opportunity. Now let me talk about some notable blueprints. I believe these are fights where the guy who lost the fight or who got awarded a gift decision, this is boxing, gifts happen, right? You know, show me a boxing card and there's at least one Christmas present delivered in one of those fights. But if you're watching a fight and a favorite looks so limited that the announcers are openly asking, what's wrong with him? Is he having an off night? Is he injured? Then you know that the opponent is doing something right. Now, some notable Blueprint fights to me. These are fights where I saw the fight and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. Right? This opponent has problems he or she might not be able to address. Right? Those fights are just some recent ones. Evander Holofield against Nikolai Valuev. Right? Now, if you saw the fight, you know Evander Holofield won that fight. Right? We're going off of what actually happened, not how the judges scored the fight. More importantly, though, Holofield circled Valuev. It was an in-and-out game. He had Valuev looking completely limited, to the point where Holofield didn't even have to throw that many punches. The blueprint was so profound that David Hay literally copied the blueprint, in my opinion, when he fought Valuev and when he beat Valuev. If you put a tape of Holofield Field's masterpiece against Valuev, and to me, for a fight to be a masterpiece, a fighter's going to have to do something original. I don't give the guys copying the blueprint the credit that I give the guys who came up with the blueprint. If you look at Holofield's masterpiece, against Valuev. 
side by side with David Hay's victory over Valuev. And keep in mind, this is how David Hay got the crown. The two fights are almost identical. More importantly, for gamblers like you and me, Valuev's lack of foot speed was something he couldn't cure. Because keep in mind, you know, balance is something you have taken your entire life to learn, right? Either you have the coordination or you don't. Just like a lack of hand speed is hard to cure, a lack of foot speed is very hard to cure, right? It sounds easy to say to someone, just move your feet faster. In practice, it's harder. I thought Holofield's fight against Value have created a blueprint that other guys with Holofield's skills, body coordination, foot speed themselves, right? It only works if you have Holofield type foot speed, right? Coordination, you know, an ability to counterpunch and stuff like that. That blueprint was tailor made for David Hay. Let's talk about some other blueprints. Let's go back a few years. Carl Frotch is fighting Brian McGee. We forget that McGee at that point was a powerhouse fighter. Carl Frotch then starts drilling McGee to the body. It was in that fight, in my opinion, that we discovered that McGee, who looks great on film in my opinion, couldn't take body shots. What does that mean? That means that years later, when Lucien Boutte fought Brian McGee, he drilled him to the body. When Mikael Kessler fought Brian McGee, he drilled him to the body. I'm just here telling you that, you know, if you look at that Carl Frotch Brian McGee fight, and it's rough and tumble, by the way, that's a great fight. It's rough and tumble. You'll see that it's Carl Frotch's body shots that eventually not only win the day, but established a blueprint on how to deal with Brian McGee. Let's talk about a favorite fight of mine. The most feared man in boxing at the time, Paul Williams. He was unbeaten. Looked like he was going to reign for a while. He went up against a southpaw. Great chess player, Carlos Quintana. Right? All I can say is Quintana, a southpaw, goes heavy on left hands and movement. Quintana's not even trying to really box with Paul Williams. He's just backing up, coming in with big left hands. I'm just here to tell you that that fight is so jarring. Quintana gave Williams his first loss that after that, Sergio Martinez, a southpaw, was willing to fight Paul Williams, had success against Paul Williams, Right, may have beaten Paul Williams twice. First fight officially went for Williams. Second fight's the infamous knockout fight. But understand, Martinez wasn't alone. Eris Landy Lara, another southpaw, then fights Paul Williams. I'm just here to tell you, their fight styles look awfully similar to what Carlos Quintana was doing when he fought Paul Williams. And keep in mind, in that fight, Quintana was a huge underdog. I consider that a blueprint fight. I consider Floyd Mayweather's deconstruction of Ricky Hatton, where Ricky Hatton, as that fight progresses, keeps running into Floyd Mayweather, check left hooks and punches and stuff like that. In other words, Floyd kept that fight such that Ricky Hatton was paying dearly every time he tried to step inside on Floyd Mayweather. Right? Mayweather wasn't going to beat Costa Zoo against Ricky Hatton. Right? I thought that fight made Ricky Hatton look vulnerable as he rushed in. I think that impacted Ricky Hatton's career. I also believe Floyd's recent fights, his fight against Robert DeGhost Guerrero, where he uses movement and a lot of lead right hands. Right? And keep in mind, Floyd's right-handed. And his fight against Canelo, where he used aggressive movement. He made Canelo look like he had very slow hand speed. He made Canelo look like he had average at best foot speed. I believe those fights will ultimately prove to be blueprints for other fighters to follow. 
right? Keep in mind, it's not a blueprint until it's been followed successfully by subsequent fighters. I'm just laying out possible blueprints for opponents who might not be able to do much about it. I'm not sure if Canelo can do much, quite frankly, about his foot speed. I also feel Canelo's in a rough position in his career where he's going to have problems making weight. At 154, might have to move up. And let's face it, we have some big punchers at 160. Sinead Golovkin, Peter Quillen, and others. I believe Bernard Hopkins's fights against Jean Pascal could be possible blueprint fights. Certainly his fight against Kelly Pavlik was a blueprint fight. I'll even throw out there, just for the boxing hardcore, that his fight against Joe Calzaghe is probably the worst I've seen Calzaghe look. That's the kind of fight that had Calzaghe stayed in the game. Someone with big time defensive skills could have tried to emulate to Calzaghe's disadvantage, right? He literally slows Calzaghe down, knocks Calzaghe down at one point in that fight, has Calzaghe running into punches, just like Floyd had Ricky Hatton running into punches, right? I also believe Vladimir Klitschko's recent deconstruction of Alexander Povetkin might haunt Povetkin in fights in which referees allow excessive holding. Now let's talk about Sean Porter. Let's talk about Devin Alexander. Let me say this. In the sport, you can tell there's some premier tacticians, right? These are the guys who come up with game plans that are original, creative, and that give their fighters advantages. One of the premier tacticians in the game is Timothy Bradley's trainer, Joel Diaz, right? Understand that Joel Diaz with Timothy Bradley came up with, in my opinion, the blueprint on how to beat Devin Alexander. Bradley gave Bradley gave uh, Alexander his first loss. Understand, Alexander is a southpaw. He has blinding hand speed, and I mean blinding when he gets going, right? He's very accurate. He has some very big punches. His uppercut literally finished Juan Urango, right? He can knock you out. He can beat you down. He's an explosive puncher when he wants to be. He also can be high volume, right? But what Timothy Bradley did was he came inside on Alexander and he smothered him. Right? He actually showed that Alexander, quite frankly, was a limited fighter inside. Understand, had Timothy Bradley stayed outside and tried to box Alexander, it might be a different fight. But instead, Bradley came inside, turned it into a wrestling match. And of course, Alexander fell apart. Now, it's interesting here because Porter openly. Gave an interview after the fight where he talks about the fact that he used Timothy Bradley's blueprint. In fact, early in the fight, if you look at Showtime's production, they're actually going to tell you, I believe it's in the first round, that Porter has been talking to Joel Diaz, right? Whose brother, by the way, Porter beat in a rematch using body shots. Right, Joel Diaz actually advised Porter on this fight. And Porter came in knowing that despite his own foot speed, despite the fact that Sean Porter actually is a pretty good fighter outside, he used to fight with a bounce, he used to dance around the ring. Porter knew that he was going to come inside and negate Devin Alexander's southpaw stance by smothering him. And Porter is perfect for it. First of all, look at the body work Porter did against Joel Diaz's brother, Julio Diaz. By the way, the same Julio Diaz who gave Amir Khan all he could handle. And let me point out that, of course, the guy in his corner that day 
was Joel Diaz, right? In other words, Joel Diaz is the kind of guy who can make life complicated for the Devin Alexanders and the Amir Khans of the world, right? Joel Diaz, as you may recall, is also the guy who starts screaming at Timothy Bradley early in Bradley's fight against Richland Provodnikov because Bradley wasn't following instructions. And, of course, Bradley himself admitted after the fight that he should have listened to his trainer. Well, here, understand that Sean Porter is shorter than Devin Alexander. He has great balance. He can fight low. In other words, he can duck his head. He's not a fighter who's stiff and upright. He's not Vladimir Klitschko. Right, you know the fighters who need, right, you know, their balance, right? Sam Peter, another guy, stands upright. He's not that guy. He's a guy who can actually bend, bend his legs, come in low, duck his head. That's exactly what's needed against Devin Alexander, right? Plus, he's shorter than Alexander. So he can fight low. He's coordinated. In other words, he's not a stand-up fighter who is falling down when he bends low and stuff like that. He's not falling to the canvas every time Alexander clinches him, right? He's not looking like David Hay looked against Vladimir Klitschko. No, this guy is actually coordinated low, and he can come in behind punches, in this fight, it's interesting. He continually throws a jab over Alexander's low right hand, right? Hits Alexander with the jab, then comes inside. So Alexander's temporarily blinded. Then Porter is right here on him. And, of course, Porter knows how to clinch, right? You know, as he gets inside and Alexander, he's smothering Alexander's uppercut. Because understand, if Alexander just times Porter on the way in, Alexander, who has uppercuts with both hands, not just the left they mentioned on Showtime, but he also has a right uppercut, right? Alexander would be able to discourage a guy hanging around down here around his solar plexus. But Alexander can't time it because Porter isn't predictable. Porter has foot speed and coordination. So this is a fight that isn't aesthetically pleasing. Porter is coming in and literally roughhousing Devin Alexander, but sometimes you have to roughhouse a Ferrari. Right? You can't let the car get on the track and race its own race. Right? So Porter, quite frankly, in my opinion, dominated the fight. You actually notice the gap in the scoring. Put it this way. I know the judges had the fight closer than the guys on Showtime, but I agree with the Showtime scoring. They had Porter winning by a few rounds, right? This fight didn't come down to the 12th round. The only question in that 12th round is, can Porter stay on his feet? But make no mistake, Sean Porter wins this fight by smothering Devin Alexander in much the same way, by the way, that Bernard Hopkins smothered Felix Trinidad, who looked unbeatable before that fight, right? Where was Felix Trinidad's left hook? Smothered by Bernard Hopkins. Here, you have to ask yourself, where was Devin Alexander's jab? Where are his uppercuts? Where was the hand speed? Smothered by Sean Porter, who came inside who was able to tie up Alexander, who, when they were inside, had a hand free, right? That's by design. It's not by accident. He comes in, he hits Alexander with jabs. Then he's up on Alexander throwing punches. Then as they grapple, he's hitting Alexander with his free hand. In other words, maybe Alexander's a superior boxer from distance. I know these guys fought in the amateurs and Alexander won it. But Alexander's not the superior grappler. He can't handle guys inside. Think about it, too. There were headbutts in the Timothy Bradley fight. There's a headbutt here. Sean Porter gets headbutted. 
the heads come together. Keep in mind, you have a righty against a southpaw, right? The point, though, is Alexander gets lured into these fights, and then his hands are down here because he's a guy relying on hand speed, right? So inside, when you're grappling him, his hands get low, heads exposed. There are headbutts, right? Just, just food for thought. Alexander doesn't operate in that game well. So this is a guy who may have won every round against Marcus Maidana. By the way, this fight should tell you something about Marcus Maidana, right? Why wasn't Maidana able to get inside and turn it into a roughhouse affair? Alexander won practically every round against Marcus Maidana. You'll notice that he has movement in that fight that he doesn't have here because he's not being roughhoused. He's not being held. Alexander may have won every round against Randall Bailey, Right? Again, you'll notice there's movement in that fight. Bailey doesn't have the foot speed to keep up. But if you have the foot speed, if you know how to clinch, if you know how to go to the body, if you can bend, and if there's a height dynamic where you can fight lower than Devin Alexander, and if you could turn a boxing match into an inside shoving grappling match, an inside game. If you can turn an Alexander match into Andre Ward versus Alan Green, then you have a shot on following the blueprint to beat Devin Alexander. Right? Let me also point out, too, that as you can imagine, the casinos, the outside world looks at this before the fight as Alexander the Great. Right? They're remembering the Bailey fight. They're remembering the Marcos Maidana fight. They're saying, oh my goodness, how can someone cope with Alexander's superior hand speed? This is the answer. If you knew that Alexander has problems with inside roughhouse tactics, you understood that the pre-fight line on this fight, I think Porter was something like a 3-1 to -one underdog, was a joke right one way to handicap fights is to think of blueprints and then ask yourself does the fighter know of the blueprint and does the fighter have people around him like Joel Diaz Nacho Beristain's another guy Emmanuel Stewart was one of these guys Angelo Dundee was another one of these guys does the guy have wise men in his corner who can pull it off Sean Porter did Sean Porter delivered he's the new champ folks the people who followed our advice have a few extra dollars in their bank account right now let me just say too the hedge we recommended was Alexander by KO it's a beautiful thing when you're watching a fight and you see an underdog on his way to winning the fight, and then you can say to yourself, you know what, even if the champ gets a lucky punch, even if Alexander throws one of those uppercuts that ended it with Juan Urango, I'm protected, right? Especially when you're getting three and a half or three to one odds on the Porter side of the play. Thanks for stopping by. Let me hear from you. Tell us other blueprint fights that you believe are out there that fighters can look at and can imitate and emulate and stuff like that. I'm just here to tell you that at the top part of the sport, right, the part of the sport where everyone claims, we've heard, Sean, uh, we've heard Floyd Mayweather make this claim repeatedly, that they don't watch film. That they don't know anything about their opponent. <laughs> I'm just here to tell you the opposite is true. Boxing's a thinking man's game. You can tell watching fights. When a fighter comes out in the first round and they're doing certain things, you can tell there's a method to the madness. There's a strategy at hand. Right? The fighter is not only prepared for the opponent, they have a roadmap on what they're going to do. Right? 
the sweet science is a science. At least that's how I see it. How do you see it? Let me know. Thanks for stopping by.